Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Basic Skills and Student Outcomes Best Practice webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you wish to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Monday, March 14, 2016. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jesse Ryan. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to the Basic Skills and Student Outcomes Best Practice webinar. I'm Jesse Ryan, Executive Vice President of the Campaign for College Opportunity. The Campaign for College Opportunity is a coalition of business, labor, and community leaders who came together in response to the urgent need to ensure a spot in college for all eligible students. In order to meet the workforce demands of the 21st century and to build a strong future for our state. Remediation has long been referred to as higher education's bridge to nowhere, a path from which far too many students will fall out and never reach their college goals. I could have easily been one of those students. As the daughter of a struggling single mother, community colleges were my gateway to opportunity. I arrived at the doors of Sacramento City College eager to begin my college journey. I took the assessment test and was devastated to find out that though I placed into Honors English, I was told I also placed into Remedial Algebra. Fortunately, a counselor looked at my high school transcripts and looked at my GPA and then decided that my indicators were pretty good. So she put me directly into college level math, a statistics class. I'm happy to say that I passed that statistics class with a B plus and was able to transfer from my community college within two years. I went on to get my bachelor's degree and master's degrees. I believe, though, that had I been forced into remedial education, I might have dropped out. My story illustrates that I was lucky. Like myself, so many community college students come to community college campuses to access college classes, not more high school. We must honor the intentions of those students and put them on a path to success. I'm pleased to say that California recently made a $60 million historic investment to improve the success of community college students who enter into pre-college level courses, a stumbling block for tens of thousands of students on their way to completion. But we know that this investment is only historic with your leadership in implementing the high impact practices that are truly game changers for students stuck in remediation. Today we're going to have an opportunity to hear from content experts in the field of assessment and placement, acceleration, and contextualization, as well as answer questions from leaders uh, throughout the state who are joining us on the call. I'm happy to say that this morning I will be joined by a co-facilitator who is another remarkable expert in the field of higher education, Laura Couturier, a senior associate from HCM Strategists. Laura has been working in the college completion arena for almost two decades. Through hard work, Laura has embedded many national initiatives that have focused on redesigning developmental education, including achieving the dream the Developmental Education Initiative and Completion by Design. In that capacity, she has worked on the ground with scores of colleges, both at a state and national level, and has a keen understanding of college progress and stumbling points, and what it takes to successfully implement student success reforms. Laura, thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jesse, for sharing your personal story and, and setting us off on such an important uh, journey this morning with students at our center. And thank you also for the opportunity to join you all at this incredibly exciting moment for California's community college students. As Jesse noted, I've been at this work for a long time. I was, in fact, at the table back before Achieving the Dream even had a name. And when we set out to improve student outcomes, and we looked at students who were placing into basic skills courses, we really didn't know which strategies or interventions to place bets on. So educators at the colleges involved in achieving the dream set out to try many, many ideas. And in many cases, they willingly underwent rigorous evaluation. And so now we have good news. 
we're standing on the shoulders of that courageous work done over the past 10 to 12 years by dedicated educators such as yourselves. And the result is we now have a far more sophisticated understanding of what matters to student success. So this is a great moment to take advantage of a perfect storm. We have better evidence about what works for student success in basic skills courses. We have exciting institutional exemplars to point to. And in California, via the Basic Skills and Student Outcomes Transformation RFA, there's a significant investment to do this work that can literally change the lives of millions of students. And that brings us to the really important point of why we're all here today. We have to do this work because the status quo is not working for our students. In California, it is estimated that upwards of 85% of incoming students are assessed as needing basic skills courses. But we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that once placed into remedial courses, far too few are completing or transferring. And because we also know that low-income students and students of color are disproportionately placed into basic skills, this is a strong equity proposition. And in light of the declining economic mobility facing this country, it's a moral imperative. We simply have to do better for our students. But the good news, like I said, is that we have good strategies at our disposal, and now we have a significant source of funding as well. But quite honestly, I'd love to add that I work with many colleges that are doing this work without any funding. They do it because the evidence is so compelling. So having up to $1.5 million through this basic, basic skills RFA is an incredible opportunity. Now before we get too far into this webinar, we wanted to pause and emphasize that there are two very specific outcomes that this uh, RFA seeks to produce in the coming five years. And the three high impact strategies that we're going to highlight today with our experts were chosen because they represent the best opportunity for improved student outcomes in light of these metrics. So as you're reviewing your college's proposals, please keep in mind that each application must demonstrate clear strategies that relate to the metrics. So those metrics are, just to, to be sure that you're fully aware of them, one, increasing shares of students successfully completing a college-level English or math course, and two, increasing shares of students earning an industry-relevant college certificate or degree within two years. Now these metrics rightly take a long-term view of student success. And your college's proposal will be evaluated in light of them. So they're very important for you to know. Now I'd love to take a moment to introduce the impressive credentials of our experts today. First we will hear from John Hetz, Senior Director of Data Science at the Education Results Partnership. John brings over 20 years of experience in instruction and research in higher education. He will be speaking today on the topic of using multiple measures for student placement, which is informed by his work on predictive modeling of student placement into and performance in foundational courses, which has won him many awards, including the 2012 RP Group Best College Research Award. Next we will hear from Katie Hearn, Director of the California Acceleration Project. Katie's work on delivering the, excuse me, Katie's work on accelerating the delivery of basic skills is well known nationally. An instructor at Chabot College, Katie has been deeply influenced by the Chabot English Department's philosophy of integrating reading and writing and providing developmental students the same kinds of challenging tasks they will see in college level courses in an environment that provides the support they need for success. And last but certainly not least, we will hear from Naomi Castro, Director at the Career Ladders Project, about contextualization. Naomi brings rich post-secondary and secondary teaching and leadership experience to her role at the Career Ladders Project, where she focuses on, um, on improving transitions from high school to college. Of particular re relevance to today's conversation, 
Naomi was previously the Director for Career Pathways at El Camino College, where she helped create and refine pathways with partner high schools, as well as worked closely with local industries and the South Bay Workforce Investment Board. Before I ask John Hetz to, John Hetz to take the floor, I'd like to encourage you to interact and ask questions as we go. We will be actively monitoring the chat, the chat function. Uh, so please, we really would love for you to um, make this a really interactive and engaging webinar. Uh, please add your questions into the chat box that you can see at the bottom left of your screen. Now if you'll join me in welcoming our experts, I will turn things over to John Hepp. John, will you take the floor? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. So um, I think there's a slide with my picture on it, so let's go ahead and move to that. <clears throat> and we'll skip to that. There I am. Uh, I'm the former Director of Institutional Research for Long Beach City College, where I started a lot of this work, and I now work for Educational Results Partnership, which helps manage the uh, CalPath Plus, which is the intersegmental um, data sharing system for the state of California. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is very simple. Uh, it's using multiple measures to do a better job of understanding and assessing city capacity. Basically, what we're trying to do is do what assessment was designed to do all along, which is measure students' capacity to do college-level work. Um, and what multiple measures does is we looked across all the variety of different possible indicators of that to assess students more accurately. So we're trying to look at their capacities holistically, comprehensively, in an evidence-based way, uh, in a way that actually will bring us in compliance with the law, uh, in order to get a more accurate picture of student capacity. This is what assessment was designed to achieve, to place students in their zone of proximal development where their capacity matches the challenges of the course. That's where you get amazing educational transformations and optimal, optimal academic performance, and students are much more likely to be actively engaged in the classroom and intrinsically motivated to do the work. But as uh, Jesse and Laura already showed, uh, uh, discussed, that's not the reality. What's happening is we're using a blunt, poorly predictive, single instance method to understand student capacity, and it's doing terribly. Uh, we've seen some of the overview evidence. When we look at work from places like the Community College Research Center, what we see is that uh, the vast majority of community colleges, including those in California, use primarily, if not exclusively, standardized test and placement. And these tests severely underplace students uh, uh, in large proportions. Up to a third of students are severely underplaced. And what that means is exactly the type of situation that Jesse was discussing. So students who are very likely to get a B or better in a college or transfer level course are being placed into developmental education, often quite deep into the developmental education sequence. And what multiple measures seeks to do is try and use as many additional things that predict student performance to place students better. And one of the things we see again and again from a wide variety of work is that students' high school GPA, their overall high school GPA, is an exceptionally strong predictor of their performance in college, even in students' performance in uh, gateway courses in English and math. In fact, high school GPA in most analyses is a better predictor than everything else that can be brought to bear combined. And so when you use high school GPA to place students more accurately, um, you get a lot of really remarkable things. You reduce the error in placement. You get students into courses where they're more engaged. You dramatically increase the number of students who are placed directly into transfer level courses. The success rates in those courses are maintained or even improved in some cases, and you get double to quadruple the rate of transfer level course completion as a result. <clears throat> now in the past, doing this type of work might have been exceptionally difficult. Um, you would have had to get the data on your own, work with lots of local partners. Uh, at the state level in California, we now have the Multiple Measures Assessment Project, which is part of the common assessment. And you can see uh, a few links to get you both to an overview of the project and to a place to get started. And what we've done is uh, basically develop a wide variety of resources to support colleges as they make this, as they make this, or they, as they start this effort. Uh, we provide uh, an enormous amount of data to the colleges, help with statistical analysis as previously would have had to have been done on their own. We provide the alternative placement based on high school data uh, for those who would like it that way. And then we provide any of a variety of support, in-person convenings, connection to peers that are doing this work, webinars, campus presentations, 
uh, and uh, outreach to your local K-12 districts to encourage additional participation. And every single one of these supports is free. In terms of return on investment then, you know, the, the investment is primarily the effort of the college, and there are few interventions that offer even a fraction of potential institutional transfer, transformation of placing students more accurately. Um, and the good news is that Katie Hearn is up next, and she's going to tell you about two more interventions that are in that same ballpark and the institutional potential unleashed when you combine more than one thing. And I appreciate it. Your work truly has pioneered multiple measures across the state, and we're seeing real boosts in graduation rates at colleges that have instituted the multiple measures model with fidelity. Um, I'm going to take a moment to remind our participants of a few logistics. By utilizing the chat box at the bottom of your left screen, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And we're going to bring attention to those questions and answers portion of the webinar in just a bit. Our Twitter handle is at CollegeOp, and the hashtag for the report and this webinar is hashtag Basic Skills California. Uh, the webinar can be recorded and posted on our, actually will be recorded and posted on our website as soon as the recording has been edited. And you finally can find us on Facebook at HTTPS uh, hash, uh, slash slash www.facebook.com slash college campaign slash period. Now I have an opportunity after uh, those logistical reminders to introduce you to a really incredible faculty change agent. I won't belabor her many accomplishments as Laura already introduced the remarkable Katie Hearn, but what I will say is that we have seen Katie's tireless efforts over the last five years across the state to change the way remediation is done at community colleges. And her work around acceleration is exemplary. I think we're very lucky to have her sharing uh, some reflections of her efforts to date. Katie, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so acceleration is a, a sort of an umbrella term that describes several different strategies that move one of the RFA's key metrics of helping more students complete transfer level courses in English and math. And why this, this metric is so important is that completion of transfer level math and English is a huge and critical momentum point in students' completion of longer term goals like transferring and earning degrees. So um, our status quo in the state and nationally has been to lose a large proportion of our students in remediation before they ever reach that important early momentum point and to disproportionately lose black and Latino students in particular. And so acceleration is a set of strategies that reduce or even eliminate students' time in remedial courses so that more of them complete that early momentum point and make progress toward their longer term goals. Um, the first one, the first strategy you'll see here is what John Hess has already talked about, is, is strategies that place more students directly into transfer level courses. What the national research and research in California shows is that we are massively underplacing students into remediation, that, that a significant proportion of the students that we put into remedial courses could actually do perfectly well if we just allowed them to enroll in college level English and math courses. And so uh, an easy and clear strategy is to stop placing so many students into remediation. And we can do that through multiple measures, particularly by recognizing high school GPA and even self-reported GPA that students tell us when they come to our intake processes. Um, another, another strategy that colleges are seeing big gains from is to just lower their cut scores on their current standardized placement tests that we've been We've been holding the gates far too restrictively, and, and by letting more students in, we're seeing large numbers of students completing transfer level English and math courses, big increases in that, as well as narrowing of a racial achievement gaps. The second acceleration strategy I want to talk about here is what we call co-requisite models of remediation, where we, through our placement process, we identify that students we're concerned that students might not be ready for a regular transfer level English or math course. 
But instead of placing them into one or more semesters of standalone remedial courses, we allow them to enroll into the transfer level college math or English class and give them extra support in that class to be successful. So uh, as sort of a simple way to think about it in English would be instead of taking a three unit English 1A course, students, students who are in this category would be allowed to take a five unit 1A, the three unit regular 1A combined with two additional units with the same instructor so that they receive additional support and scaffolding on their assignments. Uh, this is really nationally, this is one of the most powerful models of increasing student completion of transfer level English and math. Uh, it's really dramatic gains, and, and whole states are moving in the direction of co-requisite models, including the state of Indiana, Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, that there's, there's whole states that are doing this. In California, it's sort of a newer model for us, but there's a lot of activity uh, in the past year or so around developing co-requisite models, and, and this, is, this is an incredibly promising thing, and it would be a wonderful thing to ensure that with part of your RFA proposal around this basic skills transformation program, an incredibly powerful thing that colleges can do. The third acceleration strategy we talk about is single semester remedial courses that are very tightly and intentionally aligned with the transfer level course that students will take. So in English, a powerful model we're seeing inside California is to allow any student to enroll in a one level below college English course. And it basically looks and feels like college English, but students are not as good at it yet. So sort of a junior varsity college English course. They're doing essays, they're reading books, they're doing the same kinds of tasks that students will see in the college level course, but they're getting more support and scaffolding and coaching to be successful at those. In math, it's, it's a, um, what we're seeing a lot of success with nationally and in California is to say, instead of saying, is a student ready for any college math course, to say, well, which college math course is a student going to go into? Are they going to go into a calculus-based math intensive field of study like engineering? In which case, they, they do need a, a lot of algebra preparation. But if they're going to go into a liberal arts or social science major or criminal justice or music, and they're going to take statistics to fulfill their transfer level math requirements, then an algebra pathway is really not a good fit for preparing them for college level work. And, and designing a pre-statistics course that, that really is aligned with the study of statistics, not just repeating K through 12 algebra content is is an incredibly powerful strategy. Colleges that have been doing this with the California Acceleration Project, uh, a study by the RP group found that students' odds of completing a transfer level math course were 4.5 times higher in CAP accelerated statistics pathways than in traditional remediation. And further, that achievement gap tracking American students were completely eliminated in completion of transfer level math at the first eight colleges working with CAP. So that's a very powerful strategy. Um, and the, these three strategies, we, they, they really emerged, this framework for action emerged from a national scan of the literature that CAP did last year, and John was part of that, uh, John Hetz was part of that project, of looking at all of the national research into remediation and seeing what were, the, what were the strategies that had evidence of producing large gains in student completion of transfer level English and math and narrowing racial achievement gaps? And these were the three that rose to the top as really producing gains that, that were substantial, double, triple, quadruple the student completion of transfer level math and English. So, you know, a lot of you are administrative leaders or even trustees. I would say as you're looking at the draft that your college is preparing on their RSA, the most important thing to look for is are the strategies that are proposed going to reduce or even eliminate students for time in math and English remediation. That's, that's the critical driver of whether you produce gains on this metric. And that, you know, ideally few if any students would be in more than one semester of remediation in math or English. At least, you know, that would be the plan that you're working toward over the next three years. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that these kinds of changes, 
involves they're, they're pretty dramatic. It's a pretty big paradigm change for how faculty have been approaching remediation in math and English. And so you want to make sure you're building into your proposal sufficient support to make that shift. And that, that means being very intentional about professional development for your faculty because all of these strategies push faculty to teach differently than they have been teaching in the past. And that, and that means we really need to support faculty to make that change. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the work that we're doing in the California Acceleration Project. We offer a community of practice that supports faculty to teach in redesigned accelerated English and statistics pathways. And those applications are due April 22nd. So you might think about whether that you want to write that into your RFA. We're also available for email and phone coaching to help you develop models and think about professional development. And we've even started offering campus visits to build support for these kinds of changes and help you develop your local plan. So um, that's just a plug for you're not in it alone and there's, there's support available for you. And as you're looking at your RFA proposal, just think about being intentional about um, accessing that support. Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. I just want to underscore that the three high impact practices that we're focusing on today, the multiple measures, the acceleration and contextualization, are the focuses of our webinar because we believe that they are truly game changers when trying to move the needle on student success. So as Katie and as John validated that there has been state and national evidence that empirically finds that these three high impact practices significantly improve outcomes for our students. We're asking colleges to work into the proposals these high impact practices so that we can see those dramatic gains for students who traditionally find themselves flailing on these paths of remediation. So I have an opportunity now to introduce uh, one of our excellent partners over at Career Ladders Project, Naomi Castro. Um, earlier, Laura talked a bit about Naomi's credentials. I would just add that Career Ladders has really been um, an incredible ally in the work of contextualization across the state and ensuring that as we redesign remediation, we're doing it with an eye towards preparing our students not just for success in college, but also career. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Um, uh, so when I was at El Camino College, uh, where I worked for eight years, uh, I, I had the opportunity to head up a, a Career Advancement Academy, which is a learning community designed for career and technical education students. And one of the um, strongest kind of components of the CAA framework is contextualization. Um, and we kind of call it uh, contextualized teaching and learning so that it's, like a, it's a, an iterative model uh, where uh, instructors are learning from their students as students are learning from each other and from their instructors. And these, um, I, it, that was such a great segue because these three different strategies just work so well together. So let's accurately place our students so that they can do better. Let's accelerate the classes that they're in. And then when they're in these accelerated classes, uh, we can also do additional things to help um, really deepen the knowledge of the basic skills um, in those settings. So contextualization is a, is a strategy um, designed to link these basic skills with academic or occupational content. Um, and what we really, really focus on is making these ideas uh, concrete. This is especially relevant for math, um, uh, but it, is, it, it, it works for all, uh, all basic skills. Um, it deepens the understanding of concepts and of course um, the absolute key to this, and really as, as a former faculty member, the really fun part is that contextualization really relies on faculty collaboration. And I just wanted to say a, a something about the, the image. It's a, this is a, at El Camino, this is a wonderful, amazing welding student with his welding instructor. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that project in a, in a minute. Um, and here's, a, here's an example of a math project. So when we talk about contextualization, there's, there's lots of different levels. And uh, the first level that people usually kind of think of uh, when they're 
first in a contextualized situation, maybe working with another faculty member or, or potentially co-teaching or doing a linked class um, is vocabulary, right? So if it's like English and auto, the English instructor is like, oh, I don't know about I don't know anything about engines. Um, give me your vocabulary, and I, I can start reinforcing that. And that's great. Um, it's it's a wonderful place to start. And our entry level auto students they don't know the vocabulary either, so it's really fantastic for them. Um, the next level that people often will go to would then be more like technical writing. So again, in the auto example, um, you could have students go from beyond the vocabulary to actually writing blogs. Um, and the blog could be about a procedure that they learned, um, and then actually going through the process of breaking it down and writing it out, again, deepens both the knowledge of the procedure that they learned in auto, but it also um, deepens their, uh, their writing skills. And then to take it to a, a, an even more intense kind of level, you could bring in an industry audience. So if you've got students live blogging about auto procedures that they've learned or reviewing parts or reviewing new cars. And then you have local um, auto shop uh, managers reading their blogs and making a comment or two. Oh my gosh, you have never seen editing like, you, like you've seen in that kind of situation because the students all of a sudden, they're writing for an audience that is extremely relevant for them. Like the person reading my blog has the ability to hire me. Um, and then I don't want to leave it there because uh, while contextualization works extremely well with uh, CTE students, it works well for all students. And we see that in uh, the, the long and beautiful tradition of learning communities that we have. Um, but we also have that in CTE. So we have transfer level. Laney College just um, started a transfer, transfer level English 1A that's contextualized for careers. Uh, that's been very successful. Um, and just to kind of um, finish up, I wanted to revisit those hearts. Um, oops, I'm having a little trouble advancing. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Uh, so students uh, welded and fabricated these beautiful metal hearts uh, in their welding class. But um, as they were doing that, they were reading poetry. They were reading everything from Bukowski, which is very contemporary, to Rumi, which is a classical Persian poet, um, about this idea of transformation and polishing your heart. And that really um, brought students to a much higher level of understanding of the process they were going through, both as students working metal, but also as college students. And, uh, and we have a lot of resources for you at Career Ladders, so you can contact us, and we'd be happy to help you out. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, this is Laura Couturier again. Uh, I just want to note that we're seeing a bunch of questions come in via the chat function. We want to thank those of you that uh, are engaging and encourage the rest of you to please uh, go ahead and send in some questions. We'd love to uh, interact with you. Uh, I also want to pause and say thank you so much to John, Katie, and Naomi for the inspiring work that they're doing. Um, I'm truly grateful for the impact that their work has had on the field, and uh, we're able to see uh, big changes happening because of their work. Next, I've been asked to speak for just a few minutes today about the role of senior leaders in weaving all of this good work together for the purposes of having a proposal that is not only successful under this RFA, but also reflects the ambition needed to dramatically improve student success. Now, I'm a historian by training, and so one of the things that my admittedly strange brain likes to do is to pause and look back over a certain time period and analyze the good and the bad of what happened. So I want to speak to a few things that we've learned over the past decade of doing this kind of basic skills transformation work that are especially relevant lessons for how you approach your college's proposal for this RFA. My first point is that we have learned the hard way that we cannot improve outcomes for our millions of students through small pilots. We have to design our work for scale from the very beginning. And that means that we need a plan that targets large numbers of students, and it means that we need to think about how all of our strategies interact with each other 
and add up to be more than the sum of the parts. I'd like to share with you an experience I had recently. A college invited me to come do a site visit because their metrics suggested that they were performing the worst of the colleges in their TACT consortium. Now it's important to stress again, they invited me to come in and review their student success initiatives and to discuss with them the latest innovations and evidence because they had found an issue in their college and they wanted to make a change. But as the site visit progressed and we were talking about different things that they could do, they kept pushing back and saying, well, we do that. We have that. But finally, one of the participants said something that honestly I couldn't have said for them. He leaned back and he looked at me and he said, you know, what I'm realizing is that while it's true that we have implemented a lot of these strategies and we have pilots with small numbers of students in many programs, they are all small and they are isolated. And isolated reforms do not add up to transformative change. It was a beautiful moment, and like I said, I couldn't have said it for him. But the good news is that the research also suggests that that faculty member was right. Experts assessing progress at exemplar institutions such as CUNY's ASAP program, Miami-Dade College, or Georgia State are seeing that a bump in student outcomes requires strategically weaving together multiple interventions. So in the case of this RFA, if we truly want to improve student success with dramatic results, multiple measures, acceleration, and contextualization, the three strategies that your experts were talking with you about today, represent the best opportunity for improved student outcomes. Another significant advance in the field, and the metrics for this RFA reflect this, is that embracing the idea that it is embracing the idea that basic skills courses are not an end in and of themselves. Successful basic skills experiences are measured by longer term gains as students complete college level courses and eventually certificates and degrees. Glenn Dubois, the Chancellor of the Virginia Community College System, is famous for saying, nobody comes to college for a degree in developmental education. And he's right. So the best work that's going on now around guided pathways, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, calls for remediation to be positioned as an integrated, relevant, contextualized, and intentional on-ramp for a student into a program of study. Again, not an end in and of itself, but a means of accelerating our students into their programs of choice. And that means in particular that we should be tapping the power of contextualized math pathways like Katie and Naomi have already described. The results coming in from evaluations of programs such as the New Mathways Project or Statway and Quantway are very compelling. And colleges and entire state systems around the country are well underway with implementation. Lastly, I will note that good implementation of student, su student success reforms is hard work. And I would encourage you to review your college's proposal with the coming years in mind and to take to heart the uh, invitations from the experts today to reach out to them because they can help you. So as you're reviewing your proposal, think in the back of your head, does this proposal set my college up for success? Some key questions, for example, does the proposal consider the professional development resources that your faculty and staff will need to teach under new models? Have you empowered your faculty to lead the reform efforts? Does the proposal lay out smart metrics that will allow you as the leadership to report back on your outcomes in a sophisticated manner to be held accountable in five years for this work? These are just a few of the things we would encourage you to consider as you provide oversight and as you review your college's submissions. Okay, now we'd really love to hear from you. So I'm going to turn it over to Audrey Dow to open up the Q&A. Audrey? Thank you so much, Laura. We have a number of questions coming in, and so I want to encourage everyone to continue um, to do so uh, through your chat box. But I'm going to take a first question from um, Hector Cuevas who asks, if our college has not implemented basic skills initiatives 
are we at a disadvantage in competing with colleges that have done so through pilot programs? Katie, would you like to take that question? Um, you know, I, part of the question is hard for me to answer because it, it asks about how are these proposals going to be assessed, and and I'm not. That's that's a hard question for me to answer. Um, but I will say that some of the colleges that stepped forward on this work early tended to step forward with, in, in fairly small ways with small pilots and, and maybe just a couple of sections at a time. And then what we're seeing with colleges now is that because the field has learned so much in the next, say, in the last five to seven years, that it's not as risky to say we're going to accelerate our English and math sequence. That that you're not. <laughs> that what, what what one person said to me recently is we're a college that would like to be on the leading edge, but not the bleeding edge. And I love that because it, and I've I've been at the bleeding edge with with colleges, and that's really hard work. But we've learned so much in the last five years that colleges that are stepping forward now in the sort of middle pack of implementation or, or even later implementation can often be much more ambitious than the early colleges who were nervous <laughs> about the changes that they were implementing. Um, but it's, a, it's just a much less risky proposition. So I hope that if you create an, a really ambitious plan around these strategies, that you wouldn't necessarily be at a disadvantage to a college that started earlier but maybe was still offering quite small scale strategies. That, that would be my hope. Thank, Thank you, Katie. Katie. I, I appreciate your thoughtful response. This is Jesse uh, from the Campaign for College Opportunity. I just wanted to add a little bit here. Um, the intent of the budget trailer language, which was the premise for the $60 million basic skills and student outcomes transformation program, was really to both pilot and scale efforts. And so to answer uh, Mr. Clevis' question, you know, we very much hope that colleges that have existing um, practices in place but they're in very small boutique infancy stages will scale them so that they're meeting the majority of our students' needs at a campus. And for other colleges, we hope that this will be the fuel necessary for them to dip their feet into actually putting in place these practices to meet the needs of students on their campuses with the intention of after piloting growing those programs as well. Thank you, Jesse, for that follow-up. And thank you, Katie, for your original answer. Um, I've got a question now for John Hetz. John, what are some of the reasons more colleges are not using placement and instructional methodologies noted in this presentation given evidence that they improve student outcomes? And this uh, question is coming from Keith Nizam. So um, there's a long list of reasons. I, I, I posted a link to a really nice introduction to some of the competing pressures that open enrollment or open access institutions have in trying to understand the capacity of their students to uh, assess them most appropriately. Um, the challenge that we have is we have the combination of or one of the sets of challenges that we have is the combination of limited resources and the need to assess lots of students relatively efficiently. And so any variety of vendors have kind of stepped into that uh, need to help to help us assess the capacity. The challenge has been that they've used a very narrow method of understanding student capacity that is not actually that strongly related to how students do in courses. That has a couple of really pernicious consequences. One is it tends to do worse to serve students of color, first generation college students, low SES students, and mathematics women. That is, it tends to under to even it, it, it tends to do even more poorly amongst the types of students in predicting performance amongst the types of students that we serve in the community colleges. But the other one is because it's not that correlated with performance, what happens is no matter where you set the cut score in the classroom, you're always going to feel like there are some students that are placed too high because their performance on the test isn't really sorting students very well into different levels of capacity. Right? It's, it's weakly correlated. So the, what happens is you'll always have some students that will be obvious to you in the classroom that feel overplaced because they've gotten there via the test despite not having good performance in the past. 
Um, there's lots of evidence too that you know, depending on how you set the cut scores, you know, a lot of students can get into some of these classes based on a short, a relatively short single instance test, partly based on chance responding. So what you have then is this pressure that makes it feel like all the students that are being placed, we constantly have students that are overplaced. And the contravening um, consequence also is that underplacement, while it is much more rampant, is less obvious. Right? We don't see it in the classroom. We don't feel it in the same way as a student who's overplaced. A student who's underplaced just looks like a student who's doing good work to us. They're the students that are getting what we say really fast. They reinforce you know, the, the instruction that we're giving. They can help other students in the classroom. They feel great to us. And so there's a differential um, visibility of the problems that lead us to, to be biased in one particular point. But there's a variety of other things that I would I really recommend as a good starting point for Jaggers and Smith paper, or Jaggers and Hedera paper. Excuse me. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Um, we have a, a kind of a statement that I want to get some feedback from um, either maybe Laura or Naomi on the call. Um, but Jack Pond um, posits, if one were to add a freshman experience or success in college course to linked, curse, to linked courses or co-requisite courses, you'd have a winning program alternative to traditional pre-college, uh, pre-collegiate series of courses. Is, do you find that to be true what, in your experiences? Uh, this is Laura. Naomi, do you want me to go first and you can join? Go for or it. do you want to go first? Yeah, go go ahead. Um, so yes. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, uh, for the most part I really do agree with that statement. Um I mean, especially the tail end of the statement was um that, that this would be a great alternative to prerequisite courses. Um, prerequisite, you know, basic skills courses, and uh, yes, yes, and yes would be my answer there. I think that the the research is abundantly clear that we want to deliver as much basic skills instruction as we can in what we refer to as a co-requisite format, um, like Katie was talking about, where the student goes ahead and gets into college level courses, but is receiving supports that surround them and are inescapable for them and make sure that they succeed in that college level course. Um, and so the content that goes into those you know, supplemental courses, those prerequisite support courses for students um, is really important. And I, I think that a lot of it, it, what we see is that a lot of the content in those courses focuses on uh, student skills and that type of uh, success in college uh, suite of information that we have. But I want to underscore that I do believe that it's also important to integrate into that uh, the uh, support for the content of the course. And so, uh, you know, that there would be a, uh, a just-in-time delivery of uh, math instruction, for example, for students who are receiving that kind of support in a co-requisite environment. Um, but yes, I, I think that that is where the field is moving. It is um, the, the research, the evidence is very, very clear that we really want to do this kind of co-requisite delivery. Naomi, what have I missed? What would you add? Uh, you didn't miss anything. That was fantastic. Um, the only thing I would add would be to uh, really try and base uh, the, whatever the theme is uh, for that first year experience um, cohort on something that really grabs students. So it, 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 there's plenty of research that shows if it's a career interest or a career pathway, um, that that's one way to do it. Uh, but certainly we've seen you know, great examples with you know, um, uh, first year experience based on, uh, like say, linking uh, Chicano literature and Chicano history. Or uh, you, know, just, you know your students. So design something, uh, something thematically that will really grab them and really excite them. Thank you, Laura and Naomi. Um, this is going to be our last question for the session. Um, and it, it is for Katie Hearn, and it comes from Laura Casas. Um, in the past, I've heard your presentation regarding content-filled, intense, and accelerated English and math basic skills learning in one semester's time. Are you still in support of this methodology? Have you received opposition? Katie. Uh, 
so thank you for the question, Laura. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that in a couple of ways. One is the one semester's time is a really important piece of this, that, that, that however you're delivering the preparation for college-level work, that you, we can't be spreading it out over multiple semesters. Um, in regards to the part of your question that was about content-filled accelerated classes, one, one model of acceleration that we have sort of shared in the past and are not sharing as much right now on the math side, uh, or, or we're sharing with qualifications, I should say, is where we just take the existing content of our traditional remedial sequence. So, so in math, that would be an algebra sequence. And we continue to require every student to go through all of that content regardless of its relevance to their career. If that's, if that's the strategy, and I will say that for math faculty, that's often the preference because it requires the least change and it allows them to, <laughs> well, they love all that algebra and they think everybody should have to do it because it's really good for us, um, that, that we're not seeing big gains from those models. So models where they take elementary and intermediate algebra and create an accelerated pathway that is maybe a single semester, um, but they're continuing to require everybody to do it rather than thinking in terms of differentiated pathways. The gains we're seeing in some of the early models on that are really modest. So we're at several different colleges where we've looked at the data. It's less than 20% of students are completing transfer level math requirements from models like that. Whereas in the statistics pathways, we're seeing 40, 40 50, and, uh, and the 60% completion of transfer level courses. And then at colleges that combine a pre stat course with a statistics inside of one intensive semester, the gain, that's College of the Canyons, that, that model is delivering gains of 80 to 90 percent of students completing transfer level math from that model. So, so if, that, if that's what you were thinking of, of just taking the pre-existing remedial pathway and kind of compressing it in math, um, I would say that is that is the model we need to do for students who are going into math intensive majors or STEM students, business majors. But otherwise, it's it's not a way to really help more students meet this uh, meet this early momentum point. So I wouldn't recommend it for students who are going to be English majors or journalism majors or all of those other majors that that are not, where they're not going to take calculus at the college level. Thank you, Katie. That was such a, a thoughtful answer and I know um, is a, a challenge that we face at campuses currently. Um, that will end our question and answer portion and I want to be cognizant of everyone's time um, and really underscore what Katie just said about focusing on practices that are truly game changers. Um, something that has definitely been evident in our conversation today is three real themes around this basic skills and student Student Outcomes Transformation Program. First, this idea that you know, we have to be willing to lift up the types of high impact evidence-based practices that have truly yielded dramatic gains, not just modest gains for students as Katie just shared. Um, Second, we need to scale those efforts. It can't be that we're offering an accelerated class, uh, a course section or a few course sections to the exclusion of the majority of students who could benefit, them, benefit from them at campuses across the state. And third, we really need to ensure that we have courageous leadership willing to champion this. Many of you are leaders on this phone that really can empower your faculty and other campus leaders to take the reins on this work. As illustrated today, we have before us this tremendous opportunity to put forth ambitious proposals. Proposals that if done well could really move the needle on student success. We know that California's community college system is at a critical juncture. Our ability to successfully move students into and through college-level coursework could determine our state's future well-being. 
I just want to say before wrapping up the call that we thank you for your dedication and leadership as well as your focus on improving student success at California Community Colleges. And I'm also proud to say that consistent with our work to create clearer pathways to degree completion, tomorrow we will release Keep the College Promise, Going the Distance on Transfer Reform, which is a report on the state progress six years later after passing our historic legislation SB 1440 to create an associate degree for transfer while guaranteeing admission to the California State University system with uh, junior standing. We hope that you will read the report and uh, participate in some follow-up that we'll have to really talk about the 20,000 students who have benefited from the associate degree for transfer and what efforts we'll need to undertake to ensure that we have more students being put on the path to transfer as the default pathway for community college transfer students across the state. Finally, I want to share with you that after today's webinar, we will be posting the webinar in its entirety. For those of you who have colleagues who were unable to join us that you might want to be able to share this with, we also will be sending out for you a list of questions that colleges should consider when crafting an ambitious proposal. Many of you will be uh, putting together your proposals in the next days, recognizing that Friday, March 25th is the deadline. We hope that after today's webinar, uh, you will follow up with our content experts if you believe that you have an opportunity to further strengthen your proposals or if you have questions about the proposals that you're putting together. And finally, we hope that you will again focus on the types of game changers that will truly ensure that more students have an opportunity to reach their college dreams. Thank you so much and have a wonderful